So now we've finally arrived at Proposition 47, Euclid's proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And in Proposition 47, we prove that given any right triangle, the square opposite the right angle is always congruent to the sum of the other two squares. To begin this proof, we are given triangle ABC with angle BAC congruent to a right angle. Now from Proposition 46, we prove that on any line we can always construct a square. Therefore, on line BC we construct a square, and on line AB and line AC we construct two other squares. Next, from Proposition 31, we prove that with any line and any point, we can always construct a parallel line through the given point. Therefore, with line BD and point A, we construct line AL, such that it is parallel to line BD. And next, we create line AD and line CF. Now, the way Euclid proves the Pythagorean theorem is by proving that the areas of the two smaller squares are congruent to the areas of the corresponding parallelograms that make up the larger square. If we can show that this is true, then we can prove the Pythagorean theorem. So there are two sides to this proof. On one side, we must prove that the square on the left is congruent to the bottom left parallelogram. And on the other side, we must prove that the square on the right is congruent to the bottom right parallelogram. Now the process of proving either side is bilateral, meaning that if we prove one side to be true, then the same techniques can be applied to prove the other side. So this allows our work to be cut in half by focusing only on one side of the proof. To begin, we will focus on proving the left side. Now, there are two major components in showing that the left square is congruent to the bottom left parallelogram. In the first component, we will show that these two triangles are congruent. So looking at square FBAG, by definition of a square, all sides are congruent and all interior angles are right angles. Therefore, line AB is congruent to line FB and angle FBA is congruent to a right angle. Next, looking at square DBEC, by definition of a square, line BD is congruent to line BC, and angle DBC is congruent to a right angle. Now, since we have two right angles, by postulate 4, all right angles are congruent to each other. Therefore, angle DBC is congruent to angle FBA. Now with angle ABC, we apply axiom 2 to attain angle DBC plus angle ABC is congruent to angle FBA plus angle ABC. And what this turns out to be is angle ABD is congruent to angle FBC. Now remember from proposition 4, if two triangles share a corresponding side, angle, and side, then both triangles must be congruent. So looking at triangle ABD and triangle FBC, we can see that they both share a corresponding side, angle, and side. Therefore, triangle ABD must be congruent to triangle FBC. So now we've proved that both triangles are congruent. And now in the second component of the proof, we focus on using proposition 41. In proposition 41, we prove that if a parallelogram and a triangle have a base in common and are in the same parallel lines, then the parallelogram is congruent to double of the triangle. First, we want to apply Proposition 41 with square FBAG and triangle FBC. We can see that they have a base in common, but first we must show that line GC is parallel to line FB. To begin, FBAG is a parallelogram, and by definition of a parallelogram, the opposite sides are parallel. Therefore, line GA is parallel to line FB. Since FBAG is also a square, then by definition of a square, 
angle BAG is congruent to a right angle. Now angle BAC is also a right angle. With these two right angles, we apply axiom 2 to attain angle BAG plus angle BAC are congruent to the sum of two right angles. Now in Proposition 14, we proved that if a straight line has two lines drawn outward from the same endpoint, making the adjacent angles congruent to the sum of two right angles, then the two lines must be in a straight line with each other. Therefore, we have line AB with line AG and line AC drawn outward such that the adjacent angles are congruent to the sum of two right angles. Then, by Proposition 14, line GC must be a straight line. Now, since line GA is parallel to line FB and line GC is the same as line GA, then line GC is parallel to line FB. So now since square FBAG and triangle FBC have a base in common and are in the same parallel lines, then by proposition 41, square FBAG is congruent to triangle FBC plus triangle FBC. Next, looking at parallelogram DBLJ and triangle ABD, we can see that they have a base in common and are in the same parallel lines. Therefore, by Proposition 41, parallelogram DBLJ is congruent to triangle ABD plus triangle ABD. So now we have parallelogram BDLJ is double of triangle ABD and square FBAG is double of triangle FBC. Now remember that we proved that triangle ABD and triangle FBC are congruent. Therefore, parallelogram BDLJ and square FBAG are double of the same congruent triangle. As a result, parallelogram DBLJ must be congruent to square FBAG. And therefore, with the two major components of showing that triangle ABD is congruent to triangle FBC, and with the use of Proposition 41, we were able to prove that the left square is congruent to the bottom left parallelogram. Now by the same techniques we used in this proof, we can also prove that the right square is congruent to the bottom right parallelogram. The only real difference with this side of the proof is that in the first component we instead focus on triangles ACE and ICB. And in the end, we attain parallelogram JLEC is congruent to square ACIH. Finally, looking at square BDEC, we can see that it is congruent to parallelogram DBLJ plus parallelogram JLEC. Now, since parallelogram BDLJ is congruent to square FBAG, and parallelogram JLEC is congruent to square ACIH, then it follows that square FBAG plus square ACIH is congruent to square BDEC. Therefore, we have proven that with any right triangle, the square opposite the right angle is always congruent to the sum of the other two squares. So this is Euclid's proof of the Pythagorean theorem. For a complete look at all the propositions used in this proof, click on the left annotation for a playlist on Book 1 of Euclid's Elements. And thanks for watching.